idea for all this really came from a dream? Yes, it did. Good evening and welcome to Knox Mente. Tonight's guest is B.B. Tinsley. B.B. Tinsley was born and raised in Chicago during the 50s and 60s. According to her, the attempt by my parents and educators to turn me into a model of ladylike citizenry failed utterly. Her exasperated parents had the wisdom to enroll her in an acting workshop at age six, and she spent over 50 years exploring the craft and art of acting, mostly in the theater. Coming of age in the 60s brought with it colorful adventures with marvelous people. At age 14, she was introduced to the Kabbalah, and that led her to her first true deep esoteric pursuit via studying the Vedas, Blavatsky, Eliphas uh, Levi, and other luminaries were added to her list. She has pursued the path of self-inquiry since that time many years ago. On August 16, 1987, then a wife and mother of toddler daughters, Bibi awakened to the cacophony of several hundred crows outside her bedroom window, as well as on the roof of her house, and she's been learning her, their language ever since. Uh, she later learned that, that that day, those days were known as the Harmonic Convergence. She lives atop us, a little mountain above downtown Los Angeles with her partner Tom, their three dogs. In 2011, she began to transition out of her acting career, and now you'll find her practicing and exploring geomancy, crystal scrying, qigong, macro photography, writing, and storytelling. Bibi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you both. It's, uh, it's very exciting, fun to be here. Yes. I'm thrilled to have you on, Bibi. It's <laughs> like, like you know, it's, it's, all, it's been in the works. Somehow it didn't happen, and here it is now. You're definitely <laughs> a friend of Nox Mente, and I consider you magical aunt. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'll take that. Definitely. And I'm definitely a friend of this show. Such a wonderful show. Well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're a great promoter of it. I, I can't thank you enough for always promoting the show, always being so 100% with us here. I forgot the Facebook. Uh oh. I'm doing it now. Sherry. <laughs> so let's get. I hate Facebook. I'm sorry. Yeah, I do too. I'm, I'm not. I on. do too. You can leave it. All... <laughs> down with Facebook. <laughs> down with Facebook. Right. If I only had a so milkshake let's... that big. <laughs> and there are so many great new uh, social media platforms now that are way better. But let's get into the show. So. Bibi, take us back. Give us the pop cultural stuff that influenced you and all the stuff that kind of set you on this journey that really sticks out as a young, young Bibi way back. What sticks out? Okay. Um, getting knocked over by a huge Great Dane when I was about 18 months old was just, there was this sense of absolute joy and fun. And that contrasted with the adult being in dismay and disapproval and worried, all this anxiety, that kind of set me off a little bit. I couldn't, I couldn't connect the dots, you know, because th there was this joyful communion with this just great big animal, and we loved each other. And, and this is a very, very early memory because I, I know I was, I was really young, very, very young. So these are the kinds of experiences where I, I would have an, a reflection of myself from the world, like this joy. And then it would be mirrored back in a strange, twisted way. So... I think I learned early on that something was not quite right with the picture. Um, now, your question, Nish, is, it's, it's such a huge question. Can you give me something very, very specific to reply to? Because that would help. Yeah, so 
think back, okay, so this, that, that's great. And that, that's a foundation to build on. And these are the kinds of things, this is why we even go here with the early stuff. So we set up a foundation of symbols in which you work from. And as we get into the dream conversation, mm -hmm. so what kinds of like say media influence you cartoons movies and and young young bb is you know mm -hmm. so early as you can recall okay i was in love with elvis i mean i really was in love with elvis Ooh. and Hi, elvis. a clinker you you're, you're just you're you're gonna really like pee your pants here my aunt took me to see elvis i was about four years old at the, he was at the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. So Jerry, you should know where that is. He was doing autographs and just, you know, milling about in the lobby. And he held me in his arms. Somebody snapped a picture. We had that picture. My mother lost it when I was about 12 years old. But I was in love with Elvis. I loved the music. I loved rock and roll. I used to dance around and sing, um, what's that? The, uh, the purple polka dot, the, I can't oh, even the remember. The purple polka dot bikini one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bici -bici but, bikini. Yeah, cartoons freaked me out. I did not like cartoons. They, they kind of, I won't say they gave me nightmares because I don't know if they did, but there was a, a sense that I had, I, I did not like, I, I was not a cartoon person. at what all. Do you, what do you think freaked you out about cartoons though? Looking back now. I probably knew in my heart of hearts that this was an entry into beings of the other world mm -hmm. that were just on the other side. I'm, uh, you know, I'm speaking off the top of my head right now, but as I was telling you that there is this sense of seeing other, the others in the cartoon characters and that they're, you know, when I was a little girl, I don't know how much it's changed, but the Bugs Bunny and all of those guys, it was really violent. My brother loved them. I, yeah. I didn't like them. I didn't like playing with dolls either. Oh, no dolls. Why? No. What was the reason for not liking dolls? I just plain didn't like them. I mean, I, there was just, I gravitated to pretend. Mm -hmm. I would put myself in a different situation. So it was, it was more playing with the imagination always. I mean, you know, from a really, really early age. And yeah. if I had friends over, it was all the more, you know, all the merrier. I'd boss them around and I'd make them do what I said. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, the director. What's your life path number, do you know, in numerology? One. I was going to say you sound like a one. I'm a one, too. So it's like the bossy thing. I totally get it. It gets it's like a little type, old type A personality. Yeah. Well, I've. I mean, at this point, we we learn we learn these things about ourselves and are able to. I'm a seven. To that's a good one. It. Yeah, seven's great. Mm -hmm. So on. So with the note with the imaginary realm in, in this. As a young BB, what kinds of things build up your imaginary kingdom or queendom? The first thing that comes to mind are colors, fabrics, silky fabric, levitation, lifting off the ground. So it's like I do have a memory of levitating when I was really young. I remember flying. Now, this could be remembering dreams. But honestly, guys, I do know the sensation of being in this waking life, putting my arms out and willing myself up off the ground is a real wee one. So this is probably something that. I, I, I use the imagination for, and I did it so intently that I created that feeling. So even though if you were to look at little Bibi back then, she would still be on the ground in my imagination, in my reality, in, my, in, in the world I was creating for myself, 
I was literally off the ground. I'm not, I'm not surprised by this. I have, it, as a very young person too, had some, some experiences like that, that I keep, I hold close to the vest because I'm trying to find others that have too. Mm -hmm. And so this okay. is, you know me, BB, I'm there with all this. So mm -hmm. I can, I understand why some people just view these things as impossible. And I think that that's limiting even just to even think that it's impossible is is limiting and therefore it is impossible right oh absolutely so okay so in your imaginary realm let's let's also get into like location where were you born and did you have a relationship with nature okay i was born in chicago uh for the first 8 weeks of my life i lived in a I guess you could call it an orphanage. It was a very nice facility where young ladies <laughs> uh, gave up their children for adoption to good families, et cetera, et cetera. So that definitely had an effect on me, as you can imagine. But I was finally adopted by Eddie and Shirley Lewison. Great folks, great people. Grew up in the south side of Chicago in Hyde Park near the University of Chicago, the Museum of Science and Industry, uh, right on the boulevard. So the sound of the CTA bus barreling down is one of my earliest sound memories. And what, what was the rest of the, what was the next part of the question, Nish? Re uh, your relationship with nature. Oh, my relationship with nature. I was very aware of light and how the inside indoors light even if it looked the same was very different from how it felt to the outside light and there was this symphony between the light and the sound of vegetation and people sounds i loved being outside i loved the air i loved the movement of the air i didn't like so much playing outside in the snow in the winter time. But when I was four years old, my dad bought a house on, it's, it's 30 miles as the crow flies across Lake Michigan in uh, Dunes country, a place called Michigan City, Indiana. And uh, God bless him for doing that because I was outside all the time. The beach and the long grassy weeds down to the beach, I lived there in the summertime and you know i'm trying my relationship with nature had a great deal to do with my developing my imagination and eventually becoming an actor wanting to do that because it was the most freedom i could possibly experience for me and this is where i felt powerful and confident and happy if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, of course it does. In, in this period, in this early period, so, okay, you're adopted, which is fascinating. And I, I think we've only talked to maybe a couple of people that said that, which is interesting. Do you recall, how old were you when you were adopted? Eight weeks. But I, oh, my so early. birth mother, yeah, my birth mother gave me up at three days old. That's really early. So I imagine you probably don't have any conscious memory of, of You'd that. You'd be surprised. Do you? This is just bizarre, you guys. Now, if you had asked me, say, three years ago, uh, this is a memory that came up as I was doing some really deep inner work a couple of years ago. And, you know... Uh, it's a sensory memory of being in a crib and looking up and seeing light and being afraid. And I saw myself folding in on myself like a piece of Japanese origami to protect myself from being found out. So this is something that it, it, it's like, I do, I have this 
image of this very antiseptic, brightly lit room that was circular. And I don't know if this is the case. It was at the Cradle in Evanston, which is a very well-known place. It still is um, for babies to be placed for adoption. I see it. It was a uh, very uh, shiny, lots of tiles and metal. And there were all these nurses who would go around and you'd look through glass down at the, at the bassinets, the cribs. So this is something I'm working on because I don't know where that's coming from. I don't really need to figure it out other than the fact that it's a very, very tangible, specific visualization that is with me now. I, this is one of the things I like about memory and why I'm always trying to get at earliest memory. There's a, I don't think I've ever said this on the show. So whereas I'm always saying, what's the difference between dream? You know, I mean, we have photos and all this, but the earliest memories are where I, th I think as far back as we can go, if we could keep pushing. So the earliest memory we have, if we push into it, I think that opens up pathways in the brain. I think this opens up gateways to pushing back further. And uh, it's a great mental exercise, no matter what. But I think there's more to it spiritually. And I'm right with you on that yeah, one. I figured you would. And so pushing into this memory and, and, and actually wanting, wanting to see, see further is something I'm interested in. So you saying that, especially and specifically as someone as a baby that was adopted out. So there's no matter what, I feel that there's going to be a, a loss because your mother that you were inside of for nine months, right? You're mm -hmm. connected to on a very um, basic level, cellular level, spiritual energy, every level you know, that it's all there. And there are studies, I mean, we of abandonment issues with children that do not, did not know they were adopted until later in life and had abandonment issues, grew up with great families, loving families, and then came out, came out to find that they were adopted like you very, very young. And it all started to click. So where do you think it will go the deeper you push into this memory? How do you see that unlocking in an esoteric way? It goes into the deep past. It goes into the, the tree roots of the DNA itself. It goes into the ancestors. It goes into the... The stuff that this body was given in order to play around here now. And it's very interesting because actually, I, I'm not sure what I was going to say at, <laughs> at that point. It is, I mean, it's all very interesting. What strikes me about it is the connection between my wanting to know more and you know i'm a ter i'm a, like this amazing hypnotic subject which is why i have purposefully not sought out any kind of regressive therapy to go into all kinds of like anomalous things that have happened in my life i i feel more confident doing it my own not that it's not a good thing to do but i i trust myself so this is what's interesting to me. Our own sense of our own roots, the root system, the root system of the blood vessel, the DNA, there are all these trees and vines and leaves and all of this imagery and going down into the earth and into the soil and the smells that come with it and, and the, the elements and touching the idea of the mythologies that have come to us. And there's certain mythologies that I always resonated with and some that I just didn't 
make any sense to me. And what I touch as I pursue this path of going into the earth, this is where it takes me. This is where that memory, that visual takes me going through my body into the vessels of the tree of the DNA and spiraling around and down takes me into this feeling of being somewhere else. It's also here. It's like, it, it's not the past. It exists here, but it's, it's in the ground. For me, it's not a scary place at all. It's really beautiful. Just so you know, I have a lot of stuff with uh, Pluto in the eighth house. So I really, um, I love contemplating death, but not in the way that most people think. I think death is this just beautiful mystery and it's gotten a real bad rap around here. Yeah, definitely in the Western world where, yeah. it, you know, it's been intentionally removed from us. And, and, and that's all part of the social engineering. I wanted to talk about, so while we're on the subject, you mentioned mythology. And so pushing back into this early period, what was the mythologies that were coming up for you as a young kid? Now, I happen to know that you ended up finding out you have Sami blood. Mm -hmm. So it, immediately, uh, my mind, and I, as I found out, I do do as well. I thought it was just straight up Norwegian. And uh, so I'm interested to know what mythologies at this young period were popping up for you. Okay, well, here's the deal. As wonderful as my parents were, they were old world and they were um, from very conservative Jewish families. So it was not allowed that I could be anything other than what they were. They, could, they couldn't deal with it. And I did love the, the, uh, the stories of the women in the Bible, Rachel and Deborah and um, Naomi and her and the story of Ruth. God, I love the story. I love Whatever. Ruth too. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. I will go, your people shall be my people. This, I, I'm sure it moved me when I was really little because it, it, it was kind of the story of my life. And so there was that ancient Hebrew aspect. But it, then when I was in school, I, I was very fascinated with looking at what I could find in the library about prehistoric humans. I was really, really, I was obsessed, fascinated by this. The, the, there were a couple of pictures of Neanderthal people and their death rites, and they looked so beautiful to me. And from there, I started learning about English history and Druidic history. Uh, I, actually, I was blessed. I went to a great school. I went to, I, I didn't do well there because I have ADT, but I, I did do well in my own sense. It was successful for me. It was part of the University of Chicago. It was a laboratory school. And the amount of um, resources this place had was wonderful. So I, I was I was rich in that as I was growing up. And so, you know, when I was in second, third, and fourth grade, I started learning about Celtic people and people who had who painted their skin blue back in the day. In, oh, the in pics. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it was then early on, I really developed fascination for these, um, the Celt and the Druids. And I loved ancient Egypt. When did I start learning about Atlantis? I had a wacky aunt who I really loved. And she championed me. And she would get me um, adventure books written for young adults when I was like eight years old. <laughs> and she it was great because I, uh, there was this one, um, Beautiful, tragic love story 
with a heroine by the name of Teo, and she was supposed to have been a sacrificial victim in uh, the ancient Maya the culture. And one of the ball players uh, fell in love with her, and he rescued her, and they ran off. So this is where I was going when I was really little. I loved this job. And all of the um, Frank L. Baum books, oh, when yes. I was in third grade, <laughs> I would pull all-nighters. You know, I, I would I would pretend to be asleep, but I would stay up all night working my way through all of these just classic fantasy stuff. And I've forgotten your question. Well, I'm trying to connect in, and, and you're a great example because you're adopted, genetic right. memory right. to the mythologies that you, because you were raised basically Jewish. So genetic memory... You see where I'm going with this, Beebs? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I'd forgotten about that. Um, yes, I, I can actually, I could draw a graph of my progression of learning about myself. One thing that that school did, it wasn't that I was that smart. They just put uh, seventh and eighth grade together. So I was 16 when I graduated high school. And I was young when I left my parents' home. And I jumped in big time in, in the 60s, this was, as you can imagine. And I recall doing, um, it might have been LSD, and I was with a young man who I later, I actually eloped with him. I started speaking a language that came very easily. It wasn't French. It was more like this Germanic guttural language. And we were both delighted. And I had this sense of myself in a different time and a different culture with um, Germanic tribes all around me. And this fascinated me. I was all of 18 years old. So, I, you know, it was at that point that. I still didn't know. I did not know what I was. There was this huge taboo in my family about um, doing any kind of investigation. It's really too bad. They were very, um, it's not, they were, they wanted me all for themselves. It was, ba it came from a place of absolute love. But it, it took me a long time to discover that I am actually, I've got a lot of Scots a lot of Celt, I've got the Sami, and the Jewish part is less than all of the, the Celtic and the, you know, the Sami is a small part, but it's definitely there. And I had been fascinated with my first husband, Kirk. I became obsessed with the Highlands of Scotland. And when I found out that my birth father had been a Scotsman, it, it was like, um, imagine the most wonderful epic movie music you know making a a point in a um a climax a, a punctuation the movement is going to change now in this person's life i was fulfilled it was profound i wept and this was affirmation for me that, um, I mean, let me just go back. When Kirk and I were talking about Scotland, and I was 18 and 19 years old, I didn't find out about my actual Scottish blood until I was in my 50s. So a long time passed. And this is kind of a recent, a recent development to know yeah, I, I did have my DNA thing done. I'm really glad I did. It's made a big difference. But it's not like it was all new. It was an affirmation for things that I have discovered and sensed about myself throughout my life. Yes, and, and that's why it's a great, it's another great case study on genetic memory because you were raised completely with that stuff devoid. When, and so just to wrap this section up, uh, 
when did you find out you were adopted? How old were you? They told me from the get go. Oh, because you, you know, they could have played it off. You were so young when they adopted you, eight weeks or something. They went by the book. And what psychologists said at that time when I was born, that it was um, the thing to do was to tell the child right away. And I remember getting up in the middle of the night and going into their bedroom and crawling into bed and saying, tell me about the day you got me again. Mm. I love to hear that story. I really mm. did. Did you have, when you found out, or, you know, did you ever have a sense of sorrow or? Oh God. Okay. This is really interesting, Nish, Jerry. I think you'll find this interesting. One of my earliest memories is of probably when I had moved to a big bed from a crib, lying in bed, not knowing what I was feeling was actual sadness. It took me the later years to understand that but the most profound, intense feeling. Now, I thought everybody was supposed to feel that way before they went to bed. You know how kids do. Not everybody had this feeling. But it was, it was absolute, profound sadness. It was a, a grief of, of um, almost indescribable proportion for such a little body. So that's what I, I had. And I didn't know. And of course, they were clueless, my parents. I had nobody to explain that that was normal. That would have been cool. Yeah. yeah. Did, okay. And so also just on this bare root stuff, I happen to know you're naturally a ginger because I've seen your hot go photos. <laughs> you're a hot <laughs> thing going on. And uh, do you know, are you RH negative? No, I'm not. Okay. But because by all appearance, you did, uh, you know, I'm like, hmm, she's ginger. She's got, you know, she's far out. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many clues. <laughs> um, okay. And then also, so we know, obviously, you were raised Jewish. So that's another backbone in, in the story arc of you. So let's move on to... What was your dream? So this is young BB, and this can just be, we'll just keep it and say like the first third of your life. What was your relationship with dreaming? What did you think of it? Were you a dreamer? How did the landscape look? I loved my dreams. I, I loved my dreams so much that sometimes I would wake up, I would be thirsty, and I figured out a way, or it was natural, I'm not sure of the process, but I would go back if I was having a fabulous dream. It's usually flying around, around the treetops with a bright moon out. I would be able to go back into that dream. So I loved, I loved my dreams. And I would also have dreams where my friends would show up. And it was, it was, You know, there's this feeling also that that hypnagogic state and that sense of um, being both within the dream and not in the dream. And I remember feeling that as a really, really early child. And I later learned that many um, people who are on an Eastern spiritual path, I mean, the great traditions, in the, the Shaivite path, there is a word called Jivan Mukta, and it is uh, it loosely translates as one who is awake within the dream. And I remember reading that for the first time and knowing exactly what it meant. And when I was a late teenager and into my early 20s, when I was doing a lot of psychedelic Splorin and spelunkin, I would touch into that state. But it it was it was just a reminder that whoa, I remember this from when I was really little. So this is this is very important to me, actually, 
regaining that sense. And I also imagine, well, getting back to your question, let me go back to your question of what were these dreams like? What was my dream life like? It was about being in that state and carrying it over into waking up and having that kind of drift away as I got older. So this you is very important to me. This, so you mentioned, so in the early stuff, you were flying about. And do you remember the first time you flew? Well, it's very possible that I had a dream where my actual birth mother was flying with me. Oh. Do you remember that dream? She also had red hair. And I, I, I know this because I recently I've, I saw her picture for the first time last year, believe it or not. Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I see her the the beautiful young adult with this flowing long red hair and me the little kiddo both of us in flowy fabric doing these um more like swimming through the this gorgeous liquid that was shiny mm. that's really wonderful feelings yeah 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 i but beyond that, I really can't, I don't know. Mm. And so also just in your early life, so you were Miss Flyer and okay. Dynamic of flying. How did you fly? What was in the early you? Were you Superman kind of flyer? Were you flapping your wings kind of flyer? Were you a floater? I started out, I believe, by willing my body upward. And sometimes I do remember dreams where I would find myself levitating and then realizing that, oh, I'm not attached to the ground. And <laughs> I would use my arms. I mean, I'm doing it now as I'm trying to remember <laughs> this. Just, you know, moving the limbs and getting the feel of <laughs> how to make yourself go up and down and sideways and turning somersaults was a big thing. Yes. And when I was really little and I spent all that time in Lake Michigan growing up, I would do the same thing in the water. It, well, this is an interesting dynamic. There's, for me, there's not a lot of difference between say outer space here and inner space and water. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So you also mentioned in the early dreams, you would have friends show up. I'm, I think that's provocative. It, I don't hear that a lot. And so do you think that, did they, did it a feel, did it feel or appear as if this was a part of your own personality or did they feel as if they were your friends, you know, and you were meeting in dream time? These are my friends meeting in dream time. And <laughs> as you're saying that I'm laughing because my dreams are very social. I am a so I love throwing parties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I I have parties in my dreams. I mean, I I say in dream time, come on over. And oh, and this is usually the case. Yes, I like I like to entertain <laughs> in my dreams. But I I like to Would see you consider yourself Would you consider yourself an extrovert? In some ways, I am. In some ways, I, I most assuredly am. In other ways, no. So it's not as cut and dry. Depends okay. on my mood. Well, it can be, you know, a lot of people land right there in the mid-range. And so, and it's a sliding scale no matter what. What anyone says, it's all sliding scale. So, and then, so I gather... From these descriptions, I immediately just think you saw you were having vivid colors and not black and white. I don't know what it is to dream in black and white. I've always dreamt in color. I, I, I hear people say that they've never dreamt in color. Honestly, it confuses me. I don't know what to make of that. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand it, truly. No, very, very colorful, always. 
Does it appear as the world appears to you in the outer world, your dreams? What's the difference? I think it depends on the dream, Nish. It really mm -hmm. depends on the dream. I've had dreams that are definitely not earthly whatsoever. And then the dreams where it's, it's just as normal as can be until I suddenly realizing that my dead grandparents are calling me inside to have dinner and nothing else, you know, there's nothing untoward about it or, or different from everyday waking so-called reality. So I, it, it depends, but I've had across the board. It depends on the dream. Did, okay, so let's look at, I wanna look at, I wanna talk about the dead, of course, you know, it's my, my favorite subject. Uh, lucidity. So I gather from, from what you've given me already and then the way you push back on these early memories and as of course you you listen to the show so you understand at least where i'm coming from with lucidity it's mm -hmm. a scale and where do you find yourself in there are what's the difference for you within the dreamscape between the unfiling dreams and lucidity and and even OBEs. Do you get OBE? Where are you on this lucidity scale? I have had many lucid dreams that have happened spontaneously where I realize that I am dreaming. Now, this is very interesting because I did, this started happening when I was in my 20s, I think. As I began to investigate and find out more about what is known as quote unquote lucid dreaming, it, it became harder for me to wake up in a dream because I, I for whatever reason, I wouldn't even go there or try to figure that out. It still happens, but it's a spontaneous thing. And there are times when I will spontaneously become aware that I really am dreaming. And I think I've got to try something. And then something about my imagination in my dream. I'm aware of my imagination jumping ahead. And I'm thinking in my dream, oh, I wish I wouldn't do that. And then freaking myself out <laughs> and waking up. So the, lucidity is fascinating because I think that there are sometimes Sanskrit does it like nothing else. There are siddhis and, and you would spell it S-I-D-D-H-I it powers that are in all these different states and I'm fascinated with that and I've experienced little inklings as I've said but it's more the feeling of being in a dream while I'm in the everyday waking world, which really is something I, I, I is, it, that is important to me. It's more that, that bringing my dreams here more than bringing here to my dream that I just said that for the first time to myself. Yeah, that makes sense to me. That's, I find that quite interesting. So the idea, and you talked about this earlier, waking within the dream, and that's it's something I'm always talking about. And we understand, those of us digging around, understand that this inward, outward situation as above, so below, as within, so without, it's connected and it there's a bridge. And it's also said that your dream state is your constructive area, you know, your, <clears throat> your Lego kit, if you will. You build your dreams there and you, you bring them into the physical with your will. You build the thought form, <clears throat> you know, in that space and you, you pull it into physicality by your will. Yes. Yes. The There's Absolutely. definitely something to yeah. that. Yeah. 
Well, that's exactly what, what I'm saying too, is that it's that connected to me that, so if you're awakening within the dream, that just the thought form alone carries into your outer world. And so you're awakening within your outer world experience. So becoming lucid in the outer world, which I think we're, we try to agree that this is right now. <laughs> I think there's so many layers, it's, but. It's the one that, that are, I don't want to say soul, but whatever, you know, your, your spirit, it's the one is focused on out of all of them. I think that's how it works. Where your attention point is, as this uh, done one. Or we could be pinned here. It's either way. True. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you mentioned Don Juan and Carlos Castaneda. I'm, I've always been deeply moved by all of that material. Mm -hmm. And I recall uh, this was actually, this was a bone of contention with a very long-term friend of mine who who so at some point i guess he got debunked right and they said this was all just rubbish and so then a lot of people picked up that story for themselves and just decided because the idea that all this stuff the Don Juan stuff was rubbish it had no meaning well i call bollocks to that because Good. It's incredibly significant. And the deeper one gets into these waters, the more relevant it becomes, the more these techniques that are uh, unfold in the, in, the, in the books are relevant if you're working them and trying them. So I don't care how he came about this information. This is solid stuff. I agree. In my opinion, and this is, all of that are tools that I think people should have in their tool chest to work with. And so this is not wasted time. Uh, reading, reading those books and putting those principles in play. Whereas none of it is, none of this is, these talks, these discussions about dreaming. And where I like to go, which is what you've just brought up, we need to have more, in my opinion, we need to have more of these conversations about waking up within the outer world, within life, because it's easy to, 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 you know, in a way bilocate, like it's, it's almost fluffy. The idea of waking up within the dream, right? It's more solid for some reason, if we talk about it in terms of our waking life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. And as you're you're talking, what occurs to me is that in my experience and why this is so important to me, I'm I'm bridging these worlds that I experience within myself. So it's not an either or a situation with these very, very black and white demarcations between them. There is this flow of different experiences from different realities that I, I want to be aware of here now. And it's, it's, it, I think the word, I'm going to use the word expanding my awareness so that I can experience more of my attention point, as we referred to it earlier, Jerry more have my attention point in in a greater repertoire of of um realities this is where language gets really tricky words are hard worlds worlds Realm, different worlds realms realms locas <laughs> oh look at your cat She likes to listen to the show. So uh, the thing that struck me when you're talking about Castaneda was that he seemed like a shaman, but Anglo-Saxon or whatever he was. You know, he's not a Peruvian witch doctor. He was, he had the knowledge of a shaman to some degree and was able to convey that in, uh, in, in novel form. 
I loved, I loved those books. And, and I first started reading them in the seventies when I was living in Tucson and Don Juan was um, a Sonoran uh, shaman. And what I loved about what Castaneda did, he, he kept taking pot shots at himself in a way that he pointed to how Don Juan would find it absolutely hilarious. He would like lose himself laughing over how stupid he Castaneda was. And that really endeared me to it. But it was the feeling, guys, the feeling. I would be catapulted into that, that other world feeling. It, it's so difficult to describe. But it's it's just the dream world coming here, and this is what Castaneda provided me in those books. And the wisdom is really profound stuff that has stuck with me forever. Yeah, I, I highly suggest them. I just think whatever whatever he did and however he got the information is is so valuable. And the fact that out because they you know there was this whole debunking you know, campaign on him. And, and this is, this also talks to the idea of debunking. And I get, mm-hmm. I get where we need to be solid and, and reasonable and all that to hold down this gravity of a, of an experience we're having and we need to maintain and all this stuff. However, I think coming from it, you know, the, the people that threw out the Don Juan stuff, because they all, you know, they thought it was real. They they subscribe to it, and then they're t- you know, it's debunked, and then it's ha ha, and then they throw it out. This did no service. What it did do, though, was the people like us who are deeply affected by this information that came through in the same way Edgar Casey got his information. These same people will subscribe to Casey and not Don Juan. Or Dion Fortune, you know, this is this is a big Robert deal. Robert Monroe. Robert mm-hmm. Monroe. I mean, we could go on, and this is a big deal in the idea of dreaming and memory. This is all very, very watery material to sink our chops into because we don't know really what reality is. We have a bunch of theories, right? I mean, aren't we just always functioning on theoretical physics? <laughs> Oh, it's yes, we are, and we're people are so close minded, it's very immature, in my view. It's almost an elementary school attitude where you're given a set of rules in order to experience your studies. And if you stray beyond those boundaries, well, that's not right. No, you can't do that. It's just, it's very childish, and we need to mature. And part of that maturation is understanding that holding a paradox is the only way to allow yourself to get beyond these ideas of either or or the boundaries, that both things can have their, a reality that is valid, even if they completely negate each other and cancel each other out. So this idea that, oh, well, he's been debunked. So I, that's, it's not fashionable anymore. I can't be seen reading him anymore. That There's this idea of um, um, groupthink. It's very terrible. I really yeah. hate that. I grew up with that. You know, it, it's a terrible thing. Let's well, get beyond. We're, <laughs> we're swimming in it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's why. It, you know, that's part of what's holding down this this construct in a way. Right. So moving into into these areas though, so when when you're lucid within the dreamscape, and uh, you know, I'm also wondering, did you do you use some of those principles? Do you know how the way he stalked in the dream, the the walking position and all the tools? Uh to get lucid and all that, do you use those within in dream time? What well, methods do you use to become to push the dream further into a deeper awareness? 
I don't use a method. And the few times that I've actually pursued, quote unquote, lucid dreaming, I feel that there's this, um, a net goes over everything where I become restricted. And I do, I do have a lot of spontaneous awakenings, but I need to get to a point where I, I want to feel not held back by the discipline of practicing something what, you know, um, similar to lucid dreaming. Now, what happens when I do become aware that I'm dreaming, there is a sense of more often than not a deeper coloration, a sense of being connected to aspects of myself that are really deep and not from this life. And it feels great. I really loved that. And that inspired me to pursue a little thing, not automatic writing, but a type of writing where I was getting in top contact with those aspects of myself. Could you give us some examples of that? And that's definitely where I was going to go next was information from, from that realm. Okay. Well, I've shared before that um, I had cancer. This was in 2000. So during that time, right before it happened, I had a dream about this. I was in the summer house where I grew up and I was crawling out of the roof and I was pulling tiles off right and left, which is very... That's very symbolic, you know, just pulling the stuff off my head and climbing up on the roof and looking out and all around. There are these two women at ground level. And I'm looking around the land, and it was like a, a huge glacier, which is not at all what, what that part of the country is like. There was some melting ice. And both of these women were standing off to the side. They were wearing walking shorts. One was very, obvious aspects of myself, I'm sure, but one was very uh, masculine looking. The other one was this, she was tall and she had really, really long golden hair, very muscular. And I was taken aback and I, I just looked at them and they started walking. And the one who was really tall with the long golden hair looked back behind her shoulder at me. And it was like, well, are you going to come? Or are you going to stay there? That was the dream. So fast forward about five, six months, I get this diagnosis. And that was another aspect of my life. But I started actively dreaming about this, the one tall woman. She told me her name. Her name was Swinna. And she would show me how to swim with the body of an Amazon who is all tattooed. Lots of, it's, it's really hard to put this into language, into English. Uh, but she came, I think she was part of why I survived. She's an aspect of myself. I do believe that, that this person was in a body that that was an aspect of me that I've experienced so very 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 close now, not a higher self as one thinks of aspects of a higher self just a very wise being the word entity soul self it all melds in together but she's um She's, she's around. She speaks to me a lot. I love her very much. And she loves me. And it's like, yeah, she's me. <laughs> so, so, so she still comes to you? Oh, yeah. It, oh, yeah. So this is, I want to back up a little bit. And, I, and this is something I had earmarked one, one that I wanted to bring to the table with you was the cancer stuff and mm -hmm. how it uh move through your dreamscape 
So you've kind of introduced us to the pre before you knew. And how did your dreams play out through the process of of the your experience with it? You know, how dark did they get? What give us the narrative of moving through cancer and the treatment and your psychological stuff that may have been playing out in the dreams, along with anything that was other in the dreams too. So sure. all sure. that. Okay. Well, it was an astonishing experience. I have been with Tom for 20 years. We met a month before I got the diagnosis. So I knew I had the choice. I, I just knew in my gut that I was going to do uh, surgery and chemo and radiation. But I also knew that I was going to do it my way. I didn't know what that meant. I wasn't sure, but I knew it was going to be my way. And right off the bat, I had a dream where I went to the back door. I was living in Evanston, same place where all the crows showed up. Later, no, I told you about the crows. That was 20 years previous to this in a different area. But there were also crows who showed up in Evanston. They'd been markers. And in the dream, right after getting the diagnosis, I go to the back door and there's this white dog it was a screen door. It was locked. And there's this tea party going on. And it was like one level underneath the ground. And it just was, oh, you could hear the, the glasses clinking and sounds of laughter and like fountain somewhere and, and just, you know, lovely, elegant party of people who love each other, having a wonderful, relaxing time. And this dog knew me and I knew him. I recognized him. It was all white. And I got to the point where I almost unlocked the door and something in me, I knew in my dream that I was being presented with the choice that if I opened the door and I walked into the tea party, I was going to die. I was choosing death right then and there. And my, it, it wasn't even, uh, uh, I slammed the hard door shut. I said, no, I can't see you now. Did it die? I slammed it shut and I woke up like, <gasps> and it wasn't a nightmare, but it's like, whoa. So I really, I'm not going to die now. Nope. So that was really extraordinary. And there were dream things happening where I was, I'd be dreaming of my father who had died almost a year earlier. And Tom would have visits from him while I was dreaming about him. Tom, in waking life in the middle of the night, was having contact with my dead father while I was having dreams about my dead father. That was extraordinary. That's amazing. I know. That's amazing. So at this time, can you give us some, everything I hear about Tom, I just love him. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so I do want to get more in the narrative, the arc of the cancer dreams, but I want to tie this in now with Tom. And since, you know, you're in this new relationship and that ends up being a long-term one, as we know now, mm -hmm. uh, and you get diagnosed with cancer right at the beginning of it. And now he's having dream experiences with, your deceased grandfather or father father right and so was he also and so to me this is almost a form it's not quite dream sharing but it it's so tied in it's so close mm. it's so intimate did he have other was he dreaming with you throughout this process even via relatives or you know what's going on with him that he's sharing with you during this process that deals with dreams. I'm trying to recall. He's had extraordinary dreams of his own um, deceased family members coming to him. But during that time in particular, I don't recall that we were actively sharing 
the dreams because it was everything was very raw i do recall that i had to find somebody to run the whole thing in other words a, an oncologist i was given some names and it turns out that my old best 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 friend from first grade was my oncologist and he had left when he had left chicago when we were 14 and i was reunited with him and he and tom had this special relationship and it felt like a dream to me i felt like i was in this circle of protection the synchronicity of my doctor being my my old best friend we adored each other in first grade and he came back and he put me in in a bunch of things that no other the doctor would have and he heard me and he was like whoa <laughs> you go woman They're like that ain't supposed to happen and that ain't supposed to happen but you're bb and i get it <laughs> <laughs> that's great and yeah. that is that is uh you know for me synchronicity is so important and that's that's another powerhouse hit there so moving through the arc of cancer, as you're moving through it, did other significant dreams play out that you have a recall of now? And, and to start in, was there ever a moment you actually had fear? Oh, sure. You know, when I, when I had the fear was at the beginning. My biggest fear was I finally met someone that I could see partnering with that was my biggest fear that he would go away not only did he not go away he held me in his arms during those chemo treatments but yeah. um there was a sense of red of vitality and blood we an unspoken world now i haven't spoken to tom about this but i know i can just feel him he might even be listening right now. This world of, of life, how precious it is. He was making a film. And I ended up getting cast in a really tiny role in that film with him. So we did this for about six weeks. Might have been longer, but it, I would fly to California to be with him on the shoot and come back and get my chemo and then fly back to California. And I wore a wig and I had this sense of, the swimmer was in my dreams. I mean, she was showing me how to swim. She was showing me how to flex my muscle, how to, how to ripple that life around. She really was a, a, a teacher back then. And I, I can't point to one specific, you know, I dream journaled so much during the 90s. And when I, during the cancer period, I don't think I was, I, I was just too caught up with the life to go back to journaling. I'm sorry that I, I, I stopped. I've, I've taken it up again, but I didn't, I didn't dream journal then. It, it was it's all right. But that see, this is also what's important to me and, and something I uh I find of value is is when you're when you're able to recall a dream without having to resort to looking at your dream. I, of course you know, dream journaling is a very important thing to do. And it ta it teaches us so much. It's all about that self work. However, in conversations like this and just pulling up like cold, cold images that uh, there's something about the symbols that stick with us. So during, during the cancer period, when, is this when Swinna was teaching you how to swim and all that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That's amazing. And so when you were in the water, 
and she's teaching you how to swim do you have any memory of how that all went what was the water like were there things scary things in it uh all that there were scary things in it and i i recall i do recall i don't know where this fell in the journey of the actual treatments but it was sort of like maybe a third of the way through it feels right that she wasn't there and I was on a shoreline and I knew that I was to dive into the, this vast ocean. And I did. And I had one of those experiences that I described as being aware of my imagination, getting the better of me. And it did. I freaked myself out, but I didn't wake up. And Swinna was there suddenly, not saying anything, but there was this smile of, yes, this does happen. And the word circumspect, let's be circumspect. Let's dance away into the night. Let's be circumspect. Let's be careful. Let's be strong. Let's watch our P's and Q's, shall we? I'm kind of like speaking Mm -hmm. off the top, you know, but that's, that's how she communicates. Yeah. That's incredible. At at what point in the process here, uh, because this is, this is why I find this so significant is we're all going to transition. We're always transitioning anyway, but we know that all roads lead to that transition. And I don't care if you live to be a thousand or 2000 years old, there is still a movement through the physical world into the non-physical of some sort. That's, that's away from dreams. We're talking waking reality like this. Mm -hmm. And, and so all roads lead to it. And I'm wondering in this arc, with Swinna, at what point did you realize, so we already know you, when you realized you were not going to die, when you didn't choose death, you didn't go into the tea party. It was early on. That was in the beginning. You made this choice at the very beginning, which is significant. Mm -hmm. So facing the idea, so you'd already chose really how you were going to face this idea of greeting death. Mm-hmm. And then you have Swinna walking you through these processes and teaching you to swim and uh, all this great stuff. And I, I love the image of her, too. She sounds like a complete Amazon warrior, which is and yet part of like what we found out later. You found out later. We found out tonight your genetic history, which is you know, Celtic blonde, I think blonde and kind of Amazon, like I think Celts really do. Mm -hmm. And so with a genetic connection, and this is significant because you were raised Jewish and none of that. So these, these deeper connections you have to yourself and the sense of self that comes through that is part of the trajectory that I think moves you through this space and the arc of moving through cancer, which is an immediate visceral confrontation with the unconscious, first of all, as you would say, and then secondly, what engages you with the deep unconscious where we see water is a great symbol for that is, is death. Mm-hmm. And and this is a very significant moment, where, whether you're two years old or ninety or a thousand. I said this is a significant moment because it takes your focus away from all all that's insignificant. And so these dreams, this idea of these dreams, are important. Were you? During that period, encountering anyone you knew that had already passed. Oh, yes. Sorry, the dogs are. Um, it's not a Nox Mente without an animal. No. Yeah, we, <laughs> love, we love our animals. <laughs> I, 
I think Tom just threw them in here and closed the door. Let me, bear with me one second. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Jerry, let's scat together, baby. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? Did you, during the arc of your cancer journey, encounter anyone that you knew had, had already passed? Yes. Yes. My father, my, my, okay. Uh, Tom, uh, I'm actually 40. I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> we don't care. It's okay. Yeah, it's, it's all good. This is the fur family. <laughs> yes, we have a fur family. Yes, my my dead relatives were all over the place. Particularly my grandmother who died when I was right before I turned 13. And my father, her son-in-law. All my adopted family. And you and it's your father who also came to Tom as well. Yes, now it, he did. And this ties back with that sense of sadness that I was describing when I was really little. And I've tied that grief into the breast cancer. And there is, there have been studies done where women are found to have wounded relationships with their father more often than not with breast cancer. Now, I cannot give you details on that study, but it really struck a chord with me. And it makes sense. A lot of healing was done with my relationship with my father after he passed via, and this was breast cancer, via this breast cancer. A lot of amazing healing. And, and Tom helped in that. He was, he was called upon to uh, protect, to defend, to stand strong, et cetera, et cetera, by my father who came to him. So when, so give us some, I, I want to hear about the other, other past, which we would then call ancestors that came in and what the interactions were like. Well, my my grandmother showed up and i've been having interactions with her i also i mean not just in dream time since she since she died i she she'll show herself to me but she's gone through so many changes and by the time so i was in my 40s when i had the cancer she was like one big mushroom <laughs> That's what she looked like. Oh, my. <laughs> but she was like a chieftain of a whole universe. Holding the powwow. That was the vibe. Wow. And there was like, I, that, I was, She was in that forum <laughs> during this specific yeah. time. When I had cancer. That's how she came. She came with mushroom. Um, she was no longer human or look human, but I knew it was she. There was definitely a sense of the uh, mushroom and petite world. That's incredible. And did she, so with these interactions of her in this higher form, what were the interactions like? Was she, was she speaking with you? What? What was going on? Yeah, now th there was one time where she definitely was speaking, and I remember uh, waking up after having that dream and and feeling the sort of the air resounding with, like God, I haven't heard that voice in so long. But she wasn't using her vocal cords; she was telepathically speaking in the voice that I remembered her speaking in it when she was a human being. But she was communicating with me. There was also this sense of being in a circle and smoking something like a pipe, but with, with others there. It was dark at night. Did, 
Oh, that's so significant too. So, so jumping back, you know how I weave, I'm weaving everything. So Mm. jumping back to the interactions with your father during this period, what were those like with you and him? Before I met Tom, I was at the end stage of being in a guru-disciple relationship. The night my father died, almost a year previous to getting my diagnosis, I was at a retreat in California, funnily enough. I got the word, and there were several hundred people who ended up chanting and praying for my father to enter the um, celestial lokas with the great Siddha gurus. And I remember feeling guilty (laughs) because I wasn't so sure about that whole relationship. And he came to me, it was in my old guru's ashram. He was standing as frail as he was when he died. He, he was very old and he'd been very ill. He was very frail, but he looked up. And he didn't say anything, but he communicated with his beautiful eyes that, yes, you did the right thing. Yes, this is good. So that was right before I got the diagnosis. And there's a connection there because... He communicated to Tom time. So I don't know what all was involved, but th- that's all connected. Yeah, it, it was. Well, of course, it's signif- very significant. Who? So also during this period, others that had passed came to you? I'm trying to think. My grandfather, um, I had the wildest. I did have wild dreams. Now, these were not specific people that I remember from this life, but near the end, and I can mark this because I know the movie had had already completed, (laughs) and I I was then so tired of my wig, my head was completely bald. I was walking around Chicago completely bald, and it was so liberating. So I know this was near the end because I, I had people coming up to me that I never would have met before and they were wonderful and I realized something about myself just walking around fearlessly bald and I felt I felt beautiful. I felt yes. really, it's one of the sexiest times of my life, believe it or not. It's the Bene Gesserit from Dune. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> the so, Reverend Mothers. I was just I listening was, to a podcast they were talking about doing in the Bene Gesserit. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, my thing. God. I, one of my favorite experiences reading that. So in this dream and on this boat. Now, I did not know the people in the boat. It was, it was so real. It was so quiet. It was this pristine environment. It was a rowboat. The rower of the boat sat directly across from me. He was wearing sort of like a, a Middle Ages homespun robe with a kind of sort of like a monk, but not like a monk and a very lovely, plain, kind face. Wonderful face looking right at me. And in the dream, so I'm looking at him and I'm aware that we're, we're traveling across this. Uh, we're not, not across, we're traveling on a river and the banks are on either side. It's absolutely gorgeous. You can sense the, uh, the air. It smelled wonderful. You hear the water lapping on the boat. You hear the oars going up and down. And then I'm aware that there's this other person sitting right next to me. I turned my head and I was startled because I saw a woman with with almost midnight blue skin. And I recognized her sort of, she looked like a dakini. She's wearing a white sari. She had embedded jewels in her forehead. She had a ruby bindi between her eyes, but it was part of her, her, uh, her, it wasn't some, it, it was part of her. And it was this, 
deadpan look. And she looked at me, I looked at her, we turned back, both looked at the man rowing the boat. I think of Michael, row the boat ashore. And I woke up. That was so significant. It was so amazing to me. Now, I don't know specific, I can't give you a sentence or two in English to say why that was so amazing. It was the experience that, that you had to be there. It was a completion. It was a bridge into going forward. But also, I had the sensation that I've been here so many times before. It was like I got to be on the boat that I always go to when I'm between lives. This was a graduation gift of choosing life that here you are, you can now remember what it's like. Wow, that gives me chills because, of course, being on the boat and crying, I mean, one thinks of the river Styx immediately and crossing over and all mm -hmm. that is, you know, within that realm. And I'm wondering also within that dream imagery, what did the overall environment look like? Was it gray? Was it sunny? It was a beautiful summer afternoon. Mm. It was, there was a breeze that you could hear going through the vegetation on either side. There were trees. I think of Egypt. Mm. The Nile. Mm -hmm. A long time ago, the way mm -hmm. the Nile was that one yes. point in time. Yes. It was very lush. Yeah. Lots of green. And it was glor it was just so beautiful. That's incredible, Beebs. Really. It, yeah. It's incredible imagery. I love the Dakini in there. I, I have such an affinity for all of that Hindu mm -hmm. stuff myself. Mm -hmm. Uh it's it's just it's so deep in me. So all right, so moving through through this, I'm curious about, let's get into a little woo. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about otherworldly stuff or other dimensional beings, the others. Have you experienced the others within the dreamscape? Yes, but not to the extent where it feels like these beings are so different. I have that sense when I experience them in a waking life, but in the dream, there's a sense of more being comfortable and being home when untoward things happen than like being in the here and now and having something really anomalous happen. Where it, it, in the dream, it just makes more sense. It's a world that I'm, I'm more comfortable in, in, in my dream worlds, actually, come to think of it. So you want to know, uh, even like creatures like, um, when I've been swimming, I meet octopi who are not scary, they're, they're multicolored and very playful. Are they sentient? Yeah, oh yeah, they're friends. We know each other, we play. And they're like rainbow hued, but they can change their colors at will. And, you know, I'm going into this, even having a conversation like this, I'm aware of really going into this deep, day and getting into contact with the desires I have. I want to go back there and play with this one particular friend. I want to see if he, and I don't know how I know. Some of them don't have, are, are genderless. This is a he. And if he would allow me to play with his coloration and see if I can change it the way he does it for himself. Things like this occur. 
So there's this really playful aspect. Now, I'm, I haven't had a lot of, you know, nightmares in my life. There's always this sense, the dream world is more real. And that's why I want to bring it here. I think we're all missing out on this sensation of oh, so hard to, as Jerry said, you know, it's the languaging. Um, Just send it to us telepathically. <laughs> Let's yeah, do that for yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, music goes a long way to uh, describe it, but the sensation of the the gut and the heart being impaled with this sweet connection of joy with others, I, I yeah, that's where art comes in and having to make art to be able to convey that, you know? I mean, even if I were to send this telepathically, it would be a thought. It's up to you to 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 divine that deep feeling. I don't think right. I would... Yeah. Well, and then we, you know, a thought form then gets translated through others' filters, and it, exactly, it, exactly. This yeah. is what makes consciousness so interesting. What is the difference for you between these realms? Like, wh what do you see is the key difference between waking and dreaming? The um, a lack of belief in the so-called real world and the complete immersion in the reality of the experience in the dream world. That's the difference. Allowance. And having to play by, by whatever rules are there and fear in the waking world is a real um, impediment to, there's a sense of play, a sense of wonder, a sense of connection to the ancestors and to the descendants. It's the sense of wonderment, I think, that it would be wonderful if more people could feel that here now in the waking world. I, w I would like more people to feel that. I really would. It's such a wonderful feeling. And for me, the dream world, my dream world, okay, my dream world is very real and is very precious because there is this absolute sense of freedom, acceptance, not always, you know, I mean, not always, but it's precious because of that feeling. And I remember that's how I felt when I was a kid. In the dream, so in the in waking life, this is this is the thing when when I talk about we're all heading towards that one point, no matter what road you take. Right. Yeah. And um, which to me is also birth. Mm -hmm. There, so this is one of the things that I see as specific to this uh, apparent waking state is that this confrontation with the idea of expiration, one's expiration. And so that always seems to be whether you're courting it or not. You know, some people just want out. They're not going to kill themselves. Some people do kill themselves, but you know, so a lot of people will just write it out. They just want it to be over. Mm -hmm. Whether you're one of those people or not, uh, the idea of there's this idea of an ending where in the dreamscape, that's a loose, loose idea. It's a loose idea because we are allowing ourselves cognitively, and that's funny talking about the dream world, but mm -hmm. as we talked about earlier, uh, contradiction and mm -hmm. paradox is where it's at, baby. So right. 
the idea of expiration here, I think for me is the key, the silver key that keeps this construct together, that keeps somehow this sense of apparent realism grounded in, in this harder gravity, gravitational experience we have in waking life. And so why do you think that is, especially since you had to come full, full, fully geared and head on towards your own mortality because of a, a cancer experience and not just being an existential idea where you ponder it and and where it can be something that's just when I'm older, you know, when I'm older, mm -hmm. I, I'll die. Do you, what's your relationship with that idea of, of death in the waking world as opposed to death in the dream world and then your esoteric ideas of death altogether? Okay, it was a pivotal point. So for about a week, I, I, I experienced fear, fear of not knowing. But the experience was so raw and so visceral and so many wondrous and amazing things happened that I, it was as if I shed my skin, that I was a snake. I shed my skin. I became something else. Although that was the first thought, oh, I am something else. No, I'm not. I'm me. Hey, I'm always me. Whoa. There is no true end. So what happens here is that the, uh, the reality becomes glued according to this construction of beliefs. And what I, what I find, I, I, I spend time in meditation and I contemplate. And I, over the years, I, they're like these little plasmic balls that start out. And I can play around with them and, and construct them. And this is, I think, people don't understand that this is malleable, this reality, that it's held together by our agreeing to believe. And it comes from fear. It comes from the fear of abandonment and the fear of being punished and the fear of not being loved. There's so much freedom on the other side of that. It's, it's, it's a very rigid construct with hard right angles. This is the way I see certain aspects of the third dimension. And I don't really want to talk about dimensions because it gets very confusing. It's more allowing oneself to really pay attention. Really pay attention to what's going on. Take the, your attention the, um, off of what's going on outside of you. Really pay attention to what's going on inside of you. Because as I have done that throughout my life, I, I've made these really, really interesting observations. It's helped me a lot to the point where I can actually answer you, Nish, and say it's because of this construct. And that in itself, it's just a construct. It's really powerful because it's based on the belief of all of us. But just look at that in and of itself, how powerful that is, how powerful we are. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we, we, we've created this. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not, it is real and it is not real all at once. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It, it's, uh, but I think the more, for me, for me, it feels like the more you allow yourself or you open yourself up to anomalous stuff, the more anomalous stuff comes to you, right? And so, and it only takes, it only takes one experience to kind of push you out of a sense of uh, conviction. You know, it takes that one time to see something in the sky that doesn't fit into 
any of your stories about how this experience is going and what it is. And I mean, Jerry talks about that. That's how Jerry, that was, that's like Jerry's whole arc. He had an ET experience, you know, basically. And, and now we, today we have the Jerry that we have. Beautiful. Yeah. From, from one experience. So I, I don't know if it was ET. What was it? Uh, uh, is a craft, wasn't it? A craft in the sky. It was an orb. Yeah. A big one. But it, it changed your whole trajectory. It, I had it something it like that. This solidified part. it would be a better word. Expanded you. You were expanded. That's mm. how I, I. This was something I was looking into as, you know, possibly something to research, and it pulled me into it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Very See, talk cool. about a synchro. <laughs> the, the orb didn't pull yeah. me into it. I mean, the experience pulled me into this track. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But that's You're all right. it takes. And then the world, uh, then a new world opens up. True. Yes. And <laughs> after what, almost five years now, it's almost come full circle. So, I, I have my thinking, you know. With that expanded awareness, I've come back to my grounding, let's say, where I was before. And I don't so, know. It's hard to explain. <laughs> but see, I don't know how that's even possible because it cracks you open and then the world becomes a different place unless you've, unless you've deconstructed it enough that it no longer holds that portal energy of, Ah, uh, now I know what it is, and uh, I'm back to I'm back to the program, so to speak. Oh no, it's more like I see what's going on, and I know how to avoid it. Back to my program. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily the. Program. So, BB, on, on. You know, within this within this avenue of query, with what's possible in in the waking up within this waking dream, how, how where is that going for you? For you, where is that going? Because I know you like to talk about. I know you've had these experiences. I know you're super open to talking about death, or a lot of people are still very uncomfortable with that whole idea. Mm -hmm. Where, where is, where are you seated right now in your waking reality with all of these ideas of other, other realities and this reality? Ah. Uh. Well, I get an image of myself. There's a lot of drama going on with my family and I'm seated rather impartially more often than not, which is why, I mean, that's a good thing. But I'm also sitting on this mountain because the, the elemental earth spirits are talking to me. So I, I, I'm being called by my, my human family to be, um, what would the word be? <laughs> Grounded and uh, strong. To, to be impartial too and watch it all fly around. And there are elemental, I don't know what else to call it, I'm, I'm learning about speaking with the earth and i thought that i was going to be moving i think i'd i'd express that to you about it when we first met but tom and i actually have changed our minds about that and and being here is where i see bringing in my dream world to the earth if it makes any sense uh, there are there are our entities and spirits and i do hear them and and they want they want to know where we're at, what's going on, and and I don't want to say much more than that. But I, I have some special relationships, and I'm very honored, and I have a very tender feeling about that. 
And listening to Jerry talk about his orb experience, I'm something's happening right now because I had something happen right after we moved into the house. It was quite extraordinary. And I'm thinking that this house and the experiences with the the spirit of the place is tied to this plasmic uh, craft that it appeared and it was amazing. And I can go into the details or not. I don't think that's important. What is important is the sense I received of, I am loved, I am seen, and I make a difference. I really got that. So I'm kind of holding ground here yes. <laughs> in, in a kind of a profound way. Yes, I, I definitely get a sense of that with you. And so, okay, so with all of this, do you, do you have fears at this point? Yes. I fear for my, my eldest daughter. And there, but it's not, um, let me rephrase that. I fiercely defend her spirit here. She's been under major attack. And I've gone to battle. And I've learned a lot about my own strength. And that even if one is feeling that fear, courage is just saying fuck you to that fear. Don't be stupid about it. You know, use your practicality and your wits. But courage does not mean being without fear. And I've, I've had to experience moving through that courage a few times in the last few years. So also one of the things about fear I've noticed is it does ground us to place. It, 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 it's so visceral that, you know, think about it in the, in the night side dream. Oh, sure. When the fear comes up, it really just brings you here now and mm -hmm. into a different state of lucidity because there's this, uh, you know, I mean, it could be said there's that pump of adrenaline and the hormonal stuff going mm -hmm. on, but it's also speaking to our psychic bodies. And, and so this bleed through between, between realms of being realms of consciousness mm -hmm. and where we're seated. Uh, I mean, you said something important. I'm always me. That is something I completely identify with, and I identify with it in a non non ego way. Mm -hmm. So, because it's not I'm always me is not I'm always Nish. No, I can be in dreams, and I can I can be a toad, you know, and it's still me. Right. Exactly. And so, uh, that's that's the thing. So the the fear serves a very important purpose when you're not mowed down by it. It is, it is a fuel. Perfectly said. And so that, that's what I find interesting. And also with you and you had shuffled around thinking you wanted to move and, and then reemerged realizing what an amazing place it is. You live for various reasons on your mountain, on that vortex, uh, and then now with all these elements coming together, your daughters and uh, just all these elements coming together, it's, uh, I'm getting, I'm getting a wholeness picture from you. And I'm wondering how that's playing out in your contemporary dreams now. I'm, I'm having inklings of sitting in circle with elders. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of a i don't know where it's going but that's happening in fits and starts and i i'm you know i think that i'm i want to earn that right i want to earn that right to sit in the elder circle yes when you think of yourself as dead what imagery comes up? 
<sighs> Hummingbird upside down, backwards and inside out. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, and then shooting across the, the still called sky like a uh, shooting star, being that shooting star. Yes. That's yes. how I'll move. You know, uh, I don't know the possibilities, the possibilities. That's what's so delicious about it. It's yes. not just one thing. <laughs> You know, it's not like being with the gods in the underworld under the earth. No, it's not. I mean, it can be that way if you want it to be that way. And some of that is wonderful. Right. Well, we're, our stories are always swimming around us. And, and because of that, we're always creating them at the same time. It's like, uh, it's like a vacuum in a strange way with our stories. And when we let go, of the stories and allow ourselves to, to realize that I'm just me, no matter where I am or what I look like, non-ego, because the ego is attached to BB. Uh, right, right, right. To the, the personality. Yes. The the personality. Identity. Mm -hmm. But there are aspects of the ego, which are very, very useful. Oh, of course, we need yeah, it. <laughs> so we don't, yeah, right, right. You know, just a matter of staying in the body and, and being alive and paying attention to certain practical fears. You know, something came up that I'm going to share with you. And I think it, it, I'm learning something in this conversation about why my, my dream world is so important to me and why I want to bring that in. So I had this dream. It was a long time ago. It was before I moved to Los Angeles. It, I dreamt of my cousin about three months after she had passed. She was 42 when she died of cancer. And she was in a maze. She was like Ariadne and she was holding red thread. She gave me the end piece of the thread. She didn't say anything. But I'm understanding now, and this dream has been with me all these years. But I'm understanding something right here, right now, tonight, that she was with, she was in the ancient place. She was with, she was in the ancient future place of wonderment. So she was saying, don't lose this thread. This is, it's good here. So not that, um, oh, how, how do I put this? It was a connection and it was also, she was conveying to me, this was a gift that I had imparted to her while she was in her body as my cousin here that I, uh, wonderment has always been important to me. It, so wonderment, you gave me the chills there, by the way, uh, which I love. Wonderment is a big idea. It's a big thought. It's a big movement. It's like the great wind. And uh, I can't remember who was talking. It might have been Guffy. who was mm -hmm. talking about when it was. It was Guffy talking about wind as a friend. And mm -hmm. uh, wonderment is a portal. Mm-hmm. Don't you think the idea uh, of it alone and it put, it propels us into or out of anything that could be going on and, and anything that could be dragging us down. If we, if we maintain this wonderment, uh, there's, there's always a sense of hope. And I think with darks, even though these subjects aren't dark to me, but for in this construct in the Western world, you know, these some of these topics are very dark and macabre and whatever other adjectives people want to throw. Morbid. In. Morbid. Right. That that this this thought form of wonderment is is a doorway. And it's the doorway to the tea party. Absolutely. I love that you said that. Yeah. 
<laughs> I so I'm wondering if we have because we're kind of at that time. I'm wondering if we had any questions. I feel like I, I've been engrossed and I I uh although I don't look at the chat, but this has been a very engaging interaction. So I find sometimes with the more engaging interactions, people are silent. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm in a state. I'm in a um I've gone deep. It's delicious. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this. Like I said, I'm we're vibing, and I feel it. I definitely feel it. So, but I feel like it's that that time period where we try to keep this uh, rat. We try to keep this in in its little two hour slot. So, right. I'm if we have questions. From the chat, Jer. Let me look. And then, so while Jerry's looking, mm, I want to get your that. your ideas on. So we talked about these in the in the dream. What are your ideas on? And you've been active in the outer world with this stuff on the others in the outer world. So the mm. ETs or Ebens, whatever you want to call them, the Fae, where, where are you with that? I think each of us has our own understanding. I think it's very personal. I think that um, I don't know. I, I, it's possible that the reality is constantly changing. It feels more like a soup of an ocean of plasma, like breathing liquid uh, from the body that we're in now. But inner space is just as vast. So, and what is inner space versus outer space? Exactly. What is this thing? I don't know. <laughs> it, 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 and in a way, I think of the beings and all the beings, and I've had my share of of pretty benign uh, experiences with contact. Nothing really fearful, um, but the sense that I come away with is that people are people are people are people, no matter what they look like or where they're from. And I think of people as intelligent beings not necessarily human beings. And if we could just all understand that we're all just people, <laughs> you know, we all have to grow up. The non-human people and the people. And I think that we do have a lot to share as the human people. Too. Do you think there's a connection between seeing in the waking world, seeing the world around us as sentient so the the trees, the mushrooms, animals, you know, well, all that's, of that. Yes, absolutely. That's the feeling of wonder. <laughs> if you're experiencing, you're standing there and you're, you're experiencing the shimmer of the light force of the, of the, some people call it divine. Some people call it the, the, you know, the Shakti, the Shekhinah. If you're experiencing that, you feel it running through your body and you feel the energy of that and your hair stands on end, you know how connected it all is. So this is what I want people to feel in their bones, in their in their bodies. I would love I, I want if I could give everybody on earth that experience, I would love to do that. The, it, it, see, that's that's the this is a, a great connecting fiber and mm -hmm. or membrane, you know. So with all this and the idea that and it's great that our collective society is really coming into a, a tune in tune or having an atonement moment with the idea that the world around us is somehow sentient that that the earth is that the the, the dirt is uh, you know for god's sake animals weren't even you know, the, the church didn't even sanctify them as having souls until oh recently. My God, I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's absurd as that is. So the the idea that that the world is sentient, that everything has an energy, 
and that we're all swimming in it and that beyond our senses we there's so much more beyond our sensate experience here as humans Mm -hmm. uh, or humanoid at least that that is that's the event horizon for us collectively because that's where we're in my lifetime i've seen great strides towards that in my lifetime animals weren't considered to have souls in my lifetime and so you know and i certainly witnessed that attitude with people you know where they could throw kittens in a bag and into the river you know you see that on farms i'm sure it still goes on but it was very common practice and uh stuff like this it was just so flippantly ignorant towards other forms of living and when i ponder the idea especially when someone like you was willing to go there with me on on death i can't help but think of the fetus the baby and uh and how we're in this state where we push forward i feel like we're fetuses and we're pushing forward through that membrane and it is this a conscious thing is this a you know what what is that i can't disconnect it it's so connected to me i'm not talking on a physical level i'm talking on a metaphysical level i'm talking on a supernatural level so this isn't a story about abortion this is a story about higher consciousness it has nothing really to do with it any more than than the outer does the inner but that's you know i'll leave that for political discussions uh this is the idea that we're always in this state of pushing through membranes through development of whatever that magical substance is that plasmic galactic lit light within of consciousness is into tunnels that lead us somewhere (laughs) the birth canal is the death canal is the river the birth canal is the river we're on the river of sticks it seems like constantly you know something occurs i read earlier something today that you wrote you shared nish and that was that you see these particles dance yes smashing against each other yes i would it, immediately what i got was you're seeing the elemental consciousness yeah. we're always becoming we're moving into that and we're moving in and out of breaking these things apart and coming together and it all comes down to these little pieces of consciousness and and they must it, it you know they must be i i've always seen it whoever i was talking to this was in our discord chat for people that mm-hmm. don't right. know come in we have great conversations in there uh this uh that person had mentioned they only see it in the daylight and i have to agree that's for me too and it's usually out in open spaces uh so it's not like i can see in the house when i'm in here but i i usually need sunlight somehow is connected to it Mm -hmm. interestingly enough when i really hone down on it that's very interesting it just it what you were describing reminds me remember when i was sharing a little bit ago when in um deeper contemplations or meditation i i play with these they're like little plasmic balls of light that I can put together. I can, they, they, they're, they have the capacity to be um, constructed. They take shape. They will allow themselves to be put together and they allow themselves to they do whatever you tell, whatever I tell them. It's really fun. But to me, what I've come to understand in my experience of them and what I, I was reminded of when I read you had written earlier 
is that these are some of the aspects of consciousness we're extending yes. into. Yes. Well, isn't it the same thing that you had a grandmother that had a humanoid form and now your grandmother is evolved into something kind of mushroom-like and she's not yeah. humanoid anymore. This is the same, the same energy that's transmuted into that. Mm. <laughs> I got I mean, it. This is I your mean. grandmother. She is no longer humanoid. So you see where I'm going. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're we're becoming, we take on these shapes and forms, but throughout it all, it's this immense, immense, vast, beginning lesson, endless journey of becoming. Yes, absolutely. That's that's exactly where I go with that metaphor of of the membrane and mm -hmm. death and, and life and the river. It, it's this when this woman that was very significant to me died, uh, I don't know, three years ago, or I don't, I don't know. It was right. not that long ago. Time doesn't bind me, darling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the dream, in the, in the first dream of her after she died, which is a very traumatic, you know, it was a hard, it, her death was hard for me. And uh, it wasn't very, I, I, I run up against death is death is a friend. And so it's not, when I say it was hard, it, it's not hard in, I think, the common vernacular. Uh, it's just the missing of the physicality. Of course, yeah. She is laughing and I'm in a basement and her, there's her, her rigid husk right? The shell in which I attach so much psychic energy to, and that everyone who loved her attached all this psychic energy to, and we're holding on to this image of someone we love. And it's, you know, it's this husk. <laughs> it's a husk. Yeah. She, her spirit in there. And so the husk was seated in this chair in the basement with, you know, a big old fireplace. And, and, People are in there, we're in there, and we're focused on that and in mourning. And there she is. There she is behind it and moving around, and she's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's great. And it, and it was hard for me to discern what she's, is she laughing at us for having such an attachment towards her her humanoid form that we had all projected onto mm -hmm. and uh or was she laughing at the joke of it all the grander esoteric metaphysical joke of of it all and i think it's it's the i think it's a combo but i think that knowing yeah. her that she was laughing at how limiting it is. And my example here, which was a true dream, is to bring in how limiting this waking dream is because of our collective participation in the perceived rules of the game. That's it. Bottom line. <laughs> uh, yeah, you got it right there. It's so damn limiting. But it, Grandma's a mushroom. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, it's softening. Those rigid rules are softening. I, I also, I'm seeing a lot of change. Do you, BB, do you think that that's part of what this, say, disclosure movement's about? Because once we accept this idea that there are other forms of sentience outside of us. So we, we've we accepted, a lot of people have accepted that trees have life force running through them. Dogs have souls, cats have souls, mm -hmm. certainly the mushroom life. Do you think that this idea of now giving acceptance to the others, which current day is, is the ET phenomenon, you know, in past, I think it was, of course, the Fae and on and on. And do you think that that's what's happening collectively in this kind of, as some of the New Agers call it the event, is, are they awakening? 
uh, that we're really want to know. <laughs> I want to know. I know you are a woo queen like me. Well, I where I sit at right now, I really believe that we need to grow up. And this concept of disclosure is is just ridiculous. Disclosure is a personal experience. It's got to begin with yourself. You've got to be able to recognize yourself in a state of becoming. If you don't do that, how are you going to recognize it in the outer world? <laughs> exactly. So true disclosure, I see, yes, I agree with you that it's a matter of coming to an understanding of acceptance of the others. Okay. Yes. Now, the I'd majority also, of people Go ahead, Jerry. I just wanted to add to it. The word disclosure itself is two part dis, which means away <laughs> from, away or f away from, that and is. closure, which means closure, <laughs> ending. So <laughs> disclosure is. Yeah. <laughs> That's so perfect. Yeah. Because that Isn't underlines. That perfect. Uh, yeah. No one deconstructs these words. It's oh, so that's funny. great. That's great. Uh, yeah. I love it. So honestly, I see, I've had this sort of come to me in different ways, that um, it's going to take many generations. We're going to get there. I mean, we're not, humanity is not going to be overtaken by the dreaded sentient AI. I mean, you know, it's calling us to wake up. It's calling us to pay attention to ourselves, it's calling us to get our, our heads out of our asses, as some people say. And, because it's our oversoul, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, uh, you know, we are AI and AI is us. So let's let's take a look at everything. Let's take a look at what we've, and it's going to take several generations, but we're going to get there. I've seen it. Well, it's and self uh, self awareness, and this is is this is the perfect conversation and night for the whole idea of Blade Runner, and. Mm you know, oh. with the death of, of Rutger. Uh, Rutger and on, which was synchronistically, I put it in our, our server. He mm -hmm. died in 2019 in the film, that character. I remember that. Which is very significant, I think. And of course my conspiratorial mind goes, they killed him. <laughs> 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 so it would come true, uh, you know. Jerry, but what, you know, the, so we're speaking AI and of course, AI is what self con is, it's, it's a self-awareness. Well, also too, I could, you could look at it that he killed himself this year because that was such a strong soliloquy or monologue or whatever it was at the end of the film. <clears throat> yes. And it affected so many people that it just cemented his death in 2019. I don't know. It could happen. I think yeah. that's exactly what we're talking about, the, the power of the collective uh, thought forms. It's almost like it, it, you know, it was, or, you know, there's even the far out idea that it was placed there, you know, the whole idea that, I mean, I think we are the aliens. I think we are the AI. AI is self-consciousness self within a unit <laughs> you know, I'm I mean, totally what there with that. biological yeah. units. Mm -hmm. And so to ruminate on Roy's death and that powerful soliloquy at the end, uh, which is, I think, one of the most profound moments in, in film to date, still. Like tears and rain. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What well, created that whole metaphor. Mm -hmm. And so... I think I read that he ad libbed, he uh, improvised it. I think that's what I heard too, Jer. Makes it, sense. It's chilling. It's chilling. Mm -hmm. But it's a good way to wrap this conversation up because it is, we are them and they are us. And, you know, I am the walrus. Yeah, but not, I, I don't think all of them are us. No, well, there's the, these are the stories. So yes, there's, there's good, like with cancer back into this sort of narrative in this conversation, when we talk on a cellular level, there are malfunctioning cells within the body that are doing different things, depending on the different kinds of cancer, disguising itself so that the immune system, you know, can't, can't, 
can't go in and kill them. I mean, there's just so many different ways that our systems turn in on, on themselves. And, and when that happens, we find this idea of termination and the termination can be something is extremely high vibrational as a new state of awareness mm -hmm. rather than the ending of something. I mean, it's just where our perception is on that scale, like lucidity. Can I add something to that? Phoebe, this is your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, you said that not all of them are us. So when I experienced- uh, That's my opinion. Oh, I get that. I understand. Yeah. And, and I respect that very much. And I, I understand viscerally what you're saying. I, I think the, so, the ones that aren't us are, are, are toys. <laughs> could be. Things we've yeah. created to play with or to interact with we us. we created, yeah. yeah. Right. So right. God there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to say that with, the, with that cancer experience, I, the fear that I experienced initially was about seeing these things as other, these invading forces mm -hmm. that were not me, okay? It was when I accepted an expansion and had inner, uh, I told, it was part of it was understanding that my father was still around, that there was this overall connection with the other world that he loved me enough to come and talk to my new boyfriend. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that I said to my entire self, the entire biosphere of me, I said, you know what, guys, we are so loved. That was a turning point. Yes. They were no longer the other. They just had to, they, they, they had to get some good nutrition and stop believing in the rules and the lies and see there. I kind of saw myself as the mom, <laughs> you know, taking care of all the little cells. And when they saw that I was going to kick some ass, they, they, uh, they healed. Yes. What's well, the balance thing? I mean, if we, t if we look at it really in a, in a very, you know, in a very esoteric way or a cultish way, it's all within us. And, and so this, this biosphere that is, is our physical body, which is a manifestation of something else and unpack that however you want is balance. However, it's out of balance, however, it's expressing itself being out of balance. There is an adversary that happens. This is a splitting function. And, and so the shadow the shadow comes right the, the the shadow comes forth and now we have that that story arc that narrative and yet it's part of it's part of the biosphere of us you know aluna ash and jerry had hooked me onto this has talked about this recently with this event experience and it's something i was always deeply onto like the idea that we're a blood vessel a blood cell in a larger body i mean that's how where i was taking it when i was young i'm just yeah. a cell of of plasma moving through some larger organism and so when i think about when i've been out of balance and done like a parasite cleanse right where mm -hmm. I'm, right now i'm currently doing just a three-day cleanse with bentonite mm -hmm. clay and mm -hmm. uh you know, char carbon, charcoal, activated charcoal, and, uh, you know, just, just trying to not feed or trying to wash out the things that are feeding upon my biosphere. And I, I, I can't help in my meditation, but wonder what is that like for those things that have been thriving on my imbalance that, you know, where they were able to start taking over enough that I was feeling unbalanced. And, and then my choice therein to say enough, <laughs> I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm washing your asses out. <laughs> this, is yeah, your, right. this is your apocalypse, little parasites or whatever you are. This is, 
your apocalypse. I'm done with you and I'm moving you out. And so that on a bigger scale, the macrocosmic is, is an idea I think that's fruitful to entertain. You have such a way with, with your wording of these experiences. I'm, I'm just swimming in them. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderfully put. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you, but it's okay. Just so there's true. too much love in this conversation. <laughs> each other. Well, you know, and that was a discussion earlier when Yvonne said, you know, I love BB and I love Nish Cakes too, and you know, we're having a love fest. Where was this? Right. Well, this was on Twitter, and yeah. uh, and I think that that, and so for younger, more cynical me. That was, I mean, believe it or not, there was a time in my life when I didn't like hearts. I'm the heart queen. I'm the queen of hearts. I heart everyone. When I feel it, you know, I throw the hearts out. I have no problem with it. But there was a time when I was not the heart queen. <laughs> <laughs> and that would put me off, <laughs> you know, like, oh my yeah. God. But yeah. there is, there's some sort of turnaround that's happened at some point where pulling this all in and I realized that, that was when I started realizing how the how our parent universe is made up and that the frequencies and the frequencies are so significant in how we're perceiving the mm -hmm. world around us, how we're perceiving consciousness, that the I and I've I've always been deeply in love with the people i'm in love with my you have to be in love with your friends right Absolutely. why are you not around them unless mm. there's an adversarial thing there but i've always just been so deeply in love with my friends and mm. not in a sexual way just but mm. madly in love with them and mm. so i'm more open with it now and i realize the more i push into that narrative that story that in the end, vibration and frequency, the, the more I feel vital, the more my actual flesh feels vital, the more I have, uh, have an awareness within what's going on internally, because that's what's happening externally. So Beautiful. it's not happy to me anymore, baby. I can tell you I love you. and I mean mm -hmm. it, and I'm saying it. <laughs> Same with you, Jerry. And so let the love fest happen, honey. 1968, baby. <laughs> oh, wait. 69. Wait. 69. No. And that's yeah. where that's where uh Ben C. W. Chantner chanters at with his 20-year time loop, which is his best series he's ever done. His time loop series. Well, but, I, yeah, know, everything that. seems to be on a 20-year cycle. Yeah. You know, well, 99. 1999, yes. where C.W. Chandra's, that's the year my father died and when I got the diagnosis. Oh, this is giving me chills because it's the year my mom died. She died right past when it turned 2000, but she was uh, in a coma. So that okay. gives me chills. What an yeah. amazing period that yeah. was. That was, because I, yeah, because it happened at the end of the year for me. My father had passed in January of 99. But I didn't get treatment until 2000. So it's all about becoming. Yes. So this has been wonderful. What a great pleasure, baby. I, I always love our interactions. I love how uh, open and candid you are with any subject. Well, you just thank, bring it. Thank you so much. That's uh, really, really a huge compliment coming from you. And I, I want to thank you both. I'm so honored. You know how much I love this show and the content and the conversations really, really add something to the fabric of our reality because it's infused with the real stuff that's coming from inside of us. And I had an absolute adventure and a wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think one of our goals has always been, or one of our, the way, the way we feel is that we are seeding the cloud. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 So, I, I, that is, you getting, are. Yeah. Getting these conversations out there is seed in the cloud. And so the idea is that there are people who could just tune into the frequency and pick it up. Wonderful. Thank Be you. By RSS or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So thank you for anyone that was participating live with us. And Bibi, I will see you around in the ethers as always. Yes, thank you yes. very much. And yeah. Thanks thank you both. everyone for listening. And you can find Bibi's links in the description and in the show notes and on our Discord channel. Be sure to tune in next week. We're going to have Jay Widener as our guest, and that's on Tuesday night, not Wednesday next week. So heads up. Same time. I think it's the same. It might be earlier. Check the schedule. I think it's at 4, Jerry, 4 Pacific yeah. time. I'll look real quick. While you're looking, though, BB, it, can you, you want to plug anything? Um, I'm, I'm in that state where <laughs> it's hard to think I... Uh... <laughs> Be on the lookout for some new stories. I am working on a couple. One about my grandfather, my grandmother. grandfather I can't wait. Your stories are amazing. Your memoir stories are amazing. Thank so, you. Yeah, yeah I highly 7 PM. recommend everyone to check out Bibi's stories she's telling, which are memoirs. Yeah, they're done well. The, the voice is just incredible. And Bibi's a really great storyteller. She, you know, she's a pro. So. Get up and check that out. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye. Good night.